Today's program is brought to you by Heritage Foods USA, the nation's largest distributor of heritage breed pigs and turkeys. For more information, visit heritagefoodsusa.com. Hi, this is Celia Kutcher, host of Animal Instinct, and you are listening to Heritage Radio Network, broadcasting live from Bushwick, Brooklyn. If you like this program, visit heritageradionetwork.org for thousands more. Hey there, Farm Report listeners. This is your friendly host, Erin Fairbanks, and I wanted to share with you this week something special we did here at the Heritage Radio Network. You are about to hear a brand new episode of a new show we're working on called The B-Side. Uh, I co-hosted this program with Jennifer Luizzi, who hosts Tech Bites every Monday on Heritage Radio Network. And what you're going to hear is an A-side, B-side. Uh, we're talking to some amazing Muay Thai fighters. For those of you who don't know, I have recently really gotten into Muay Thai fighting. And so we sat down with some of the fighters we know who are also foodies. So I hope you like it. Definitely shoot us a line, info at heritageradionetwork.org. Let us know what you think. Stay tuned. All right, you have tuned in to the Heritage Radio Network. We are coming to you, as always, from the back of Roberta's Pizza here in Bushwick, Brooklyn. Welcome to the debut episode of The B-Side. On The B-Side, we sit down with some of our favorite people in food, drink, and life to talk about the other things that make them tick. And you might have guessed from the opening music, today we're going to be talking about Muay Thai kickboxing. Or maybe you, you didn't guess because you've never heard that music. Um, I'm in the studio uh, with my co-host, Jennifer Luizzi. I'm Erin Fairbanks. Um, off air, I'm the executive director of the Heritage Radio Network. And on air, I'm going to be your one half of your guide uh, as we make it through this winding road of Muay Thai. Um, so I'm going to hand it over to Jen. And she's going to introduce the amazing lineup we have uh, for you in the studio. So we have some, on our A side, we have Joshua... Bradenburg. How you doing? He is the head bartender at the Royalton. His day job is being one of the top bartenders in New York City for the past two years. He's been top 10, time out New York bartender. He's got a website called drinkandsmile.com. He does videos, classes, education. His sweet spot is American brown liquors, alcohol, whiskeys. Uh, I, I kind of am all over the map. I mean, I know a good deal about whiskeys, but uh, I actually teach classes on not just cocktails and, and how to make cocktails and cocktail uh, history, but I also, te- I also teach classes on spirit history and distillation styles and techniques of all different alcohols. Um, you name the type of alcohol, and I can tell you all about it and what I love about it. So that's his A-side, and you can find him at the small bar at 44 at the Royalton most nights. And his B-side is that he is the WKA Amateur Super Lightweight Champion in Muay Thai. (laughs) He's also also an instructor at Henzo Gracie Academy in New York City and has been practicing Muay Thai for seven years? Uh, Seven years, yeah, yeah. I think you left out one thing, Jen. I think his fight name is Broadway. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's yeah. I mean, everyone has this super cool, intimidating nickname. You've got like the Terminator and the uh, the Korean Zombie, and uh, you know all these cool fighter nicknames. And I have what I think could probably be the least intimidating fighter nickname on the planet, which is Broadway. <laughs> the it's it's worth noting that. A lot of fighters, at least most of the fighters at Henzo Gracie Academy, get their nicknames when people give them to them. I don't know that Joshua came out and said, I'm going to be Broadway, because that sounds really good by the announcer. But he has a proclivity to (laughs) show tunes, dancing, and performance, because he came from an acting and theater background in college. Yeah, I came from a musical theater background, and I kind of made the natural transition of, you know, kind of semi-retiring from the acting and musical theater. From spirit fingers to punching? Yeah, I mean, it's totally natural, right? Go from musical theater into punching people in the face. I feel like they're really related to each other. (laughs) And then high kick is high kick to the head. Well, high kick's the same in all all different languages. (laughs) Sitting next to Joshua, 
Ochoa is one of his compatriots from Henzo Gracie Academy. We have Elijah the Mayor Clark. Yeah, how are you doing, guys? He is a personal trainer for about 12 years now. Notably, he trains, he trains Jean-Georges von Gerichten, who, as we all know, is super soigné all the time. This the, is most he, the most soigné. The most soigné. And this is how he stays tight in his Prada. <laughs> Alaja is a professional fighter for the last two years? Uh, three years. Last three years, and is currently years. ranked number 19 in the world. Yes. He fights super middleweight at 165, and he's also a friend of Heritage Radio Network. He was recently up on our Charity Buzz auction block. A very, very lucky person had a friend buy them two private training sessions with Alaja and tickets to his last fight. You can find Elijah on Instagram at Elijah underscore Clark, C-L-A-R-K-E. He's also an instructor at Henzo Gracie Academy, and uh, he's got a big smile on his face, and the fun thing about Elijah <laughs> is that he's really a nice guy, and being a personal trainer, he's very generous and helpful and takes really good care of people, but when you see him in the ring, I've often thought that his fight name should be The Dragon, because he has a mohawk, he's 6'5", and he gets this very fierce, about-to-breathe-fire look on his face when he's about to come down with an elbow on you. I mean, it's a good transition. <laughs> From being the nice, smiley guy to jumping in the ring and want to rip someone's head off. How long have you been doing Muay Thai? I've uh, been doing Muay Thai about 10 years now. Yeah. And how did you discover it? Because you're originally from San Lucia, and that's not really a hotbed of Muay Thai. No, it's not. Unfortunately, hopefully one day I can bring it down there and get the youth down there to introduce it to them. I got into Thai boxing, actually stumbled on it accidentally, when a former co-worker of mine was working. He was doing Thai boxing, and a friend of mine wanted me to do, I think, a martial arts called Russian Sistema. And I walked into the gym. My coworker then told me, he's like, hey, dude, forget the Russian system. I tried Thai boxing. And it kind of steamrolled from there. I did the Thai boxing, never did Russian system. And after eight months, I had my first fight. And it kind of just steamrolled after that. Steamrolled to being ranked number 19 in the world. Yeah. <laughs> Which is amazing. Hopefully number one one day. Mm -hmm. How long do we think that'll take? Uh, give it another two or three years. Two or three years? Yeah. Okay, you heard it here first. Damn. Two or three years. I want to hear the story behind the mayor. <clears throat> wow. Uh, that, Like Jennifer said, your nickname tend to come from people from the gym. And I believe it was one the first year I was with Henzo Gracie Academy, we went down to WKA Tournament. That's the uh, World Kickboxing Association, which is the largest global... Uh, kickboxing association and they sanction all the fights and a lot of fights in different countries around the world. Yeah, exactly. And we were down there and for some reason, I mean, I had a, I had made a name for myself in the amateur rankings and stuff like that. So whilst we were at the tournament, there's people from all over and everyone kept coming like, hey, Elijah, hey, just kept shaking my hand, saying hi. And I think it was Mike McKee was like, dude, you're like the mayor of Thai boxing. <laughs> you know everyone. <laughs> I'm like, yeah. And from there, the name just kind of stuck. And I just ran with it. And the funny thing is, I think it was one of I think it was my first pro fight, and I never knew they were going to say the mayor. And they asked for your nickname, and I think Joe put down the mayor, and I never knew he did it. So when they announced the fight, they were like Elijah the Mayor Clark, and I was like, oh yeah, okay. I guess I'm like I guess that's my nickname now, and it just kind of stuck with that. And now it's what's on his shorts. The yes. Mayor. And Joe is Joe Sampieri, who is the head coach at Henzo Gracie Academy yeah. for Muay Thai. So Must Mike McKee, Mike's mm -hmm. name is Mustang. Yes. He is a longtime Muay Thai fighter and personal trainer. And that is the perfect segue to our third side B guest, Adam Eskin. His A side is he's the CEO of Dig In, which is a farm to counter fast casual restaurant. If you live in New York City, you've probably seen it. Um, it's delicious. They have 10 locations around the city and are getting ready to expand to Boston. His B-side is that he fights trains at Henzo Gracie Academy. And his story is that he was with a personal trainer who saw that Adam was getting a little bored and needed a new challenge and introduced Adam to Mustang. And he started doing Muay Thai private sessions with Mustang. And all of these guys, you can train with them, and it's amazing 
but they're really expensive. And I always liken them to high price call girls that you want to be your girlfriend, <laughs> but you can't afford to date. So I'm okay with that. <laughs> Adam, <laughs> Adam was spending all his lunch money on Mustang, and Mustang eventually brought him to Henzo Gracie Academy, where he could train every day with the Gen Pop for a little more reasonable. That's right. Down payment. That's right. So this was back in 2011. Yeah, yeah. So I guess uh, by the math, it's been four years now. And you're getting ready. You're thinking about. Getting ready to maybe fight. Yeah. Um, I think that's uh, a bit of negotiation with my better half. Uh, but as Elijah said, I think once it's one of those sports where once you get into it, uh, it's a bit of a bug, you know, and it really draws you in and you just want to learn more and train more, um, particularly if you're competitive. Are you competitive? <laughs> just a little. Just a little. Just a little. And he's not quite fought yet, so he doesn't really have a nickname. No. Are you, are, is there, are you aspirational for one? Is there one you'd like to float and maybe get some crowd support on? I don't know about aspirational. <laughs> uh, so before I started to learn how to formally actually fight, um, I, had, I had a little bit of a, uh, of a run when I was you know, in my younger years where I got into trouble here and there. Um, and I had to have a poster uh, that was given to me by, so I come from the finance industry before, before getting into the, the food business. And I was on a business trip uh, to Spain, actually, or Madrid. And uh, so my nickname back then was The Hurricane. And so I actually have a poster in my apartment now that was custom made for me in Madrid uh, that says El Hurricane uh, on the bottom. And it actually is a picture of somebody fighting bulls. So I think those are big shoes to fill. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I was like, isn't that a nickname taken? <laughs> so, uh, isn't, there, isn't there already a fighter who has a nickname, The Hurricane? But El Hurricane. I have no idea. <laughs> is that like the Nino? But uh, that's what it was before. I think I might have to earn a new one uh, once I step into the ring, if I step into the ring. Well, we can maybe think about what that would what that would be. Do you feel like you're a hurricane still? Uh, I think I've calmed down quite a bit at the ripe old age of 34. Okay. Uh, yeah. Okay. So this is our A side, B side crowd, and um, it's also a great opportunity for Aaron, who I know has lots and lots of questions about boxing and fighting, having just started her B side as a Nak Moy, which means Muay Thai fighter, back in March. I'm a freshie. Um, inspired by Jen, yeah, full disclosure, not the only fighter. The gentlemen are not the only fighters in the booth today. Um, yeah, Jen, host of Tech Bites, great show. Um, stay tuned. Fall season starts um, later in September. Uh, got me into fighting. But how did you get into fighting, Jen? I was on a trip to Thailand about 10 years ago, and we were in Bangkok, and we went to the Muay Thai fights one night at the Rajendamnan Stadium, which is one of the old um, old stadiums. It's one of the champion stadiums. And basically, if you fight in Thailand and you make it to Bangkok, you fight at Rajendamnan and then you fight at Lumpini. And we went to the fight, and there were maybe about 10 or 12 fights on the card that night. And because we were Western, they put the Westerners sort of in the front row seat. So you're on a folding chair on a concrete floor. In the front row, you have the ring. There are uh, sort of like tiered balconies of seats and with kind of chicken wire covering, like drop down in a curtain covering the seats because people throw stuff and they bet. And there's food and beer and roast chicken and um, the live, the crazy, weird live music. And so we went and the first fights were kids because in Thailand they start fighting when they're four, five, six years old. Most of them are out in the countryside in the provinces they f discover they have an aptitude for fighting. Their parents will give them to the fight camp to live and train there and be supported there, and then they start fighting and earn money to help support their families. So as they get better and they make it to Bangkok, then the first fights are kids who are like 10 years old, and maybe they weigh 60 pounds. And it goes through the evening, and the, the fighters get older and larger, and then it tops out usually with the pro fights at the end of the night where there may be... You know, these are now then people who are 20, you know, men who are 20, 22 years old at the top of their game, top, top pro fighters, and they're topping out at like 105 pounds, 110, maybe 120, 125, because Thai people physically, you know, the morphology is just, they're not huge, tall, giant people. And it's really mesmerizing to watch. You have that crazy music that's playing, they're playing it live, it's kind of smoky, people are screaming a little bit. And they come out, and the first thing they do is they do a dance called the Y Kru Ram Mui. And it's uh, 
sort of a dance. You walk around the ring, you seal the ring, and then you do a dance to uh, pay tribute to your trainer and your teacher, and then to the trainers and teachers before them on through history. Um, Muay Thai is said to have come from, you know, like the 15th century. So when you participate and you practice it, you're a part of a longer lineage. And it's extremely graceful and beautiful. And they wear flowers and crazy, beautiful silk shorts. And then the music stops and they take off the flowers and the bell goes and they start to fight. And it's absolutely brutal. They're elbowing each other in the (laughs) face and kicking each other in the face and punching and kneeing. For five rounds, and the thing that impressed me about it was they're very small, but they're very graceful, and they're just brutal and lethal. And I thought, that's a great sport for a woman. <laughs> <laughs> I'm 5'4", you know, I walk around to like maybe 120 pounds now. Um, at the time, I was even smaller. Muay Thai's made me big. Um, <laughs> but I thought, like, that would be great. I could be strong and lethal and devastating, but still kind of be small. And I'm graceful because I used to dance. And so I walked out of the fights, and all of the fight gear shops are at the stadiums. And I bought a pair of twin shorts, and I said, I'm going to go back to New York, and I'm going to learn Muay Thai. And so it took me a little while to get there, but eventually I found my way and learned Muay Thai and now train at Henzo Gracie Academy with everyone here right on well elijah i want to ask you actually um maybe to help us give um adam some ammunition for his conversation with his uh significant other um (laughs) you know one of the things you fought recently and it was the first time i had been to see a fight and one of the things i was surprised about throughout the fights was how um warm the fighters were to each other before after and even during um, where does that, that vibe come from? Like, how, I, I was surprised, you know, you're, like the bell hits and people are, n- like, nice-ish. I think one of the things about Thai boxing, because Thai boxing has a very long culture behind it, that a lot of Thai boxers not really... After the fight, it's kind of like we're all friends. We could go have a drink. We do it for the love of the sport. Yeah. Not because, hey, you know what, that guy, I want to kill him. It's like, yeah, you're in the ring and... It's unfortunate that we're in a hurt business where the, hurt the whole... <laughs> that's, that's what it is. is it I mean, a, that's a it, business. Wait, wait, wait. <laughs> is, is it unfortunate? Or is that kind of why everyone's Elijah, there you're not a little my face bit? Here, bro. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, I mean, Honey, he didn't mean the hurt business per se. <laughs> I mean, when you look at it, I mean, we across the ring punching and kicking someone in the face. But it's not no animosity towards that person. We do it in a sense of for the love of the sport. We love Thai boxing. You know what I mean? It's just unfortunate. You have... Sometimes people get hurt. They get injured. And it's with every sport. You know what I mean? You go on a soccer field, you never know what happens. And at the end of the day, you shake the person hand across from you and you're like, hey, good game. It's the same with Thai boxing. For me, growing up, I played basketball. I got injured way more playing basketball than I ever st- in Thai boxing. I mean... I would go play basketball every day. It's like sprained ankle, gem thumb, something like that. And when I started Thai boxing, my mom was like, what the hell are you doing? She goes, you played basketball, it got hurt. Now you go into a sport where people are actually trying to hurt you. Like, what are you thinking? You know what I mean? Till this day, my mom has yet to see one of my fights because she's like, she can't deal with it. She can't handle someone trying to hurt me. Well, what about your wife? How does she handle it? Oh, my wife's Romanian. She loves it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, she loves. She loves. She's been to almost all of my fights. I mean, from day one, she's been to every single one of my fights. For me, growing up, I played basketball. I got injured way more playing basketball than I ever st- in Thai boxing. I mean. I would go play basketball every day. It's like sprained ankle, gem thumb, something like that. And when I started Thai boxing, my mom was like, what the hell are you doing? She goes, you played basketball, it got hurt. Now you go into a sport where people are actually trying to hurt you. Like, what are you thinking? You know what I mean? Till this day, my mom has yet to see one of my fights because she's like, she can't deal with it. She can't handle someone trying to hurt me. Well, what about your wife? How does she handle it? Oh, my wife's Romanian. She loves it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, she loves, she loves, she's been to almost all of my fights. I mean, from day one, she's been to every single one of my fights. I also think there's just a profound level of respect, you know, when two people are entering a ring and have just gone through fight camp and know how hard it is to perform athletically endurance mentally at that level and so at the end of the fight you know i think you have you have an unusual level of respect for your counterpart you know it's like 
you both trained hard and you both showed up for three, four, five rounds, uh, it's a hard thing to do. I think one of the things, too, is that you look at when, when you have two guys in the ring. A lot of times you grow up, you play team sports, and if, if the team loses, you can say, hey, you know what? We lost. Mm-hmm. Whereas in the ring, it's all up to you. You know what I mean? Yes, you have a team with your corner man and stuff like that, but initially you're in the ring on your own. And in a way, that person across the ring from you brings out the best in you. And only that person could is experiencing what you're going through right now for that moment, mm-hmm. for those three or five rounds. So after that fight, you have the utmost respect for that person because for that period of time, you share the moment. And it's the most primal thing among men. You know what I mean? We and punch women. Uh, and women. <laughs> Sorry about that, ladies. <laughs> and women. You know what I mean? So for that period of time in the ring, no one knows what you're experiencing but that person across from you. So at the end, it's like, hey, dude, we brought the best out of each other. And that's what matters. And with my last fight, I fought a friend of mine, Brett Halabachak. And Brett and I was friend, were friends before the fight. And we're going to be friends after. So... But when the fight turns on, it's on. You know what I mean? When the bell goes off, we're going to punch each other in the face. At the end of the fight, hey, let's have a drink. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm wondering if you guys can talk a little bit about what you see as, like, your personality traits that came out maybe at the beginning and, and how those things have evolved as you've evolved as a, uh, as a fighter. I think for me, um, I'm very smiley, loving person. He's smiling right Smart. now. And I think that came out with my with my fighting style, where I was just kind of like, I go with the flow. I'm not so serious. Even during training, I always try to keep a lighter side to things, because that's the way I am. You know what I mean? I don't like to take things a little too serious. I always think, whatever you're doing, if you're not having fun, you're doing the wrong thing. You know what I mean? No matter what you're doing in life, you've got to have fun with it. You don't look lighthearted and fun when you're in the ring, though. You have this really scary expression on your face. I mean, I am having fun. It's just that I can't inside? show the, I can't show the other guy that. <laughs> and, and deep down inside, I'm having a lot of fun. It's just that I can't I can't look at the other guy across from me and start smiling. He's going to be like, I'm not scared of that guy. I'll punch him in the face. You know what I mean? <laughs> so, I think it's just have, knowing when to turn on that switch on or off. I mean, when you're training in the gym, you train with your friends, it's good to have a we, like we said before, conversation. You know what I mean? And But when you get in a fight, you have to know, hey, i got to turn that switch on. And it's just, let's go. Do you feel like Broadway smile, sparkle, shine when you're in the ring? Uh, <laughs> well, you know what's funny is the... I, I am not at all the person now that I was when I started. And it's not just like, oh, you know, I'm older and wiser. No, no, no. I mean, it has actually changed a bit of my... Uh, personality under pressure. When I first started training uh, Muay Thai, and I started uh, with uh, the Henzo Gracie Academy, and I had done some other athletics growing up, but that was my first time doing Muay Thai. And one of the nicknames I got really quickly off the bat was Intensity. Uh, Intensity, and I got the robot. Because I was so stressed, so tense, so like I'm a, I'm an, a very very uber competitive person, and I'm not I'm competitive with other people, but I'm intensely competitive with myself. I I hate to see myself fail in anything, and I hate to be less than perfect at anything. So when I took that mindset and that attitude into this sport that is all about flow and relaxation, the two did not jive together. They didn't meld. They didn't go. And what it ended up being is it ended up me kind of getting my ass kicked a lot because I was so tense and I was using so much energy and I was lacking in that relaxation and fluidity and it really inhibited my growth and inhibited me being the best training partner and the best fighter that I could be. And I don't think anyone would say that I'm a relaxed person yet. I think people would still agree that I'm a bit of an intense individual, but I've definitely learned how to have more fun and I've definitely learned a sense of fluidity and grace. I mean, I'm definitely not the most fluid person out there, but I have a lot more fun now and I take it a lot more easy and that has translated into my A side. When I'm behind the bar, 
I'm a different person behind the bar now than I was eight years ago. I've been behind the bar at the Royal Tin for eight years. And I was one of the worst people to have as your bartender if you were like a server because it was, no, I'm working on this. Don't tell me what to do. I will get this out when I get it. I'm doing my own thing. Get your nose out of my business. And, and, and I just was not a fun person behind the bar. And now it's about, you know what, man, this is just one day out of a million days. This is one day out of thousands and thousands of hours that I'm going to be doing this. So I'm not going to stress so much about this one particular instance because it's only one instance in a giant lifetime of instances. And it's the same thing with fighting where and training where I'm, you know, I have a bad day of training or I didn't do this combination right or I got injured, whatever. That's one thing out of a million times that I'm going to do it. So why stress about it? I think it's right because I think. I believe I heard Joe Rogan said this on one of his podcasts where he was like, when you look at 90, 99% of the people out there have never got punched in the face. You know what I mean? And we do this on a daily basis. You know what I mean? So for me, before I used to be very short. I'm a nice guy, but I'm very short-tempered. Where it's like, if anything happened, I'm quick to blow off the handle. But now, since I've been doing Thai boxing, I realize it's calmed me down much more. Where... I leave training, going home, no matter what happens, I'm like, yeah, whatever. I just brush it off. You know what I mean? I think Thai boxing helps a lot with that. And it's funny, one of my personal training clients told me one day, she was like, well, I have a nephew, and he's very high strong. So, I mean, little boys always get in trouble, always a ton of energy. And I told him, get him, get him into martial arts, it's any kind of martial arts. I'm not a big fan of karate and a lot, a lot of those things, but I think for, as kids... It's good to put them in any type of martial arts just to give them that discipline aspect. And she goes, well, won't that make him worse on the outside when he come out when he want to hit kids? I'm like, no, it will change him. Trust me. Because the discipline he'll learn in the, in the dojo will carry on outside. You know what I mean? Stand up straight. Look at someone in the eye. All those things will carry on outside because he does it so much in the, in the academy or the dojo, wherever he's training. And she goes, oh, wow, I thought it would be the opposite. I'm like, no, it will have the adverse effect. You know what I mean? I think any little kid with bumptious energy and just kind of like want to fly off the handle, it's good to have him Definitely in something that's structured. the hurricane. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, Adam, have you, have you found that to be the case? I mean, you know, dig in, the, the group that you run is expanding. Um, you know, it's a big group. There's like more and more people, more pressure, more responsibility, more stuff going on. Like, have lessons from Muay Thai kind of translated into your work life? And are does your staff know you fight, and are they afraid of you? <laughs> uh, I mean, <laughs> the answers to all those questions probably more on the yes side than the no side. No, all kidding. All kidding aside. Uh, I would echo uh, what both Elijah and, and, and Josh said. I mean, for me, I've always been a fairly intense person. Um, that there is, I think, a fairly keen awareness uh, around my intensity when it comes to the business that we're building and what we try and accomplish when we come to work every day. Um, but I, you know, Muay Thai for me actually has had the the adverse, um, the opposite effect, as, as Elijah said. Um, and I think part of that is because. Initially, it was really more about the physicality of it. So it was about getting really good workout in, smashing the pads, as Mustang would say, and just feeling like, you know, just completely drained and exhausted. Um, and as you pick up more skills, you know, that sort of, that, that, that the slope of that curve, it really starts, um, I wouldn't say it doesn't, it doesn't go exponential, but it, the slope really starts to accelerate. And, and I think then you, so, you sort of become addicted to the sport and to the technique and to the art of it, right? And then... Uh, at least for me in terms of you know the phases and then once you get introduced to sparring you sort of I, I, I sort of went backwards a little bit and I was like ah oh, people are trying to punch me <laughs> <laughs> a normal response yeah, like, a nor- <laughs> as the person in the room has not been punched in the face yet I think that's a totally normal response right? and then and then so like take care of that later <laughs> <laughs> thanks Jen <laughs> initially some of the anger comes back you're like dude just punch me you know uh, and then you, you go back on that curve where you start to learn about how it works and what the energy feels like and the fact that the, the more calm you are 
uh, not only just in the context of energy preservation, uh, but it's a really cerebral sport. You know, I mean, I think the best fighters that I've been watching, the, the guys to my right, the guys like Joe that run our school, I mean, it's almost like chess where they're thinking two, three, four moves ahead in terms of counter uh, and, so, and so forth. So uh, for me, realizing that it's been more about, you know, the head, you know, I'm, I'm not I'm not some crazy tough guy like these guys next to me, but certainly I don't really mind getting punched. I'm frankly. not a tough guy. Guys. <laughs> yeah, I'm not a tough guy. So so you know once you get used to like you get punched, you get kicked, and you know certainly you got to get your cardio uh, in shape. So it's uh, there's training involved, but past the physical side, I think it's it's much more about the mental challenge. All right, hang tight. You're listening to the B side, and we will be right back. All right, we are back uh, after a short break. You are listening to the B side, and I want to talk in a little bit more to the eating component of fighting, training, fight prep. Um, I want to talk about uh, going up, and I want to talk about going down in weight. So, Elijah, you're just off a fight. Um, what what do you weigh like normally walking around? Uh, walking around, I normally weigh 195 to 198. And you fought at? 168. But before that, I used, I normally fought at 165. So that's a lot of weight. Yeah. It all depends how you think of it. How do you think um, of it? I mean, a lot of times I tell, for example, I've been a personal trainer for a while now. So when I explain this to my clients, I tell them I cut weight. I don't lose weight. What's there's the difference? A, yeah. I think there's a big difference in cutting weight and losing weight. Cutting weight, I'm just doing it for the scale, and that's it. I'm putting it right back on. So when I cut weight, I'm naturally, I'm normally cutting more water weight than f- physical body mass. Okay, compared to losing weight, where I'm actually losing muscle mass, losing body fat, and all those things. So a lot of times when I say I cut weight for fight, people think, "Oh my God, you lose 30 pounds!" Like, no. I don't lose 30 pounds. If you do a little experiment, and before you work out, like right before you work out, get on the scale and see how much you weigh. Yeah. Go and do your workout, hour, two hours, do your Muay Thai class, and before you drink anything or eat anything after you work out, get back on the scale. And over the course of an hour of Muay Thai, you can sweat a couple of pounds without even realizing it. So when Elijah's saying that he's cutting weight, he's getting rid of water... You can put on and take off pounds just by sweating and drinking. Yeah, and I think for for me, when you look at a fight camp, you do give or take a six to eight week fight camp. I walk around 198. That's when I'm just training, not really being very specific with my diet, stuff like that. So when I start to really clean up my diet and be very specific and I'm eating pure for function, then naturally my body's going to drop down naturally to 185 around 185-ish during the fight camp so from 185 I'm able to cut give, I could cut 20 pounds in a week and get it back at 24 hours so you cut you cut 20 pounds you lose 20 pounds in 7 days and you gain 20 pounds in 7, 8 hours? yes I could lose it in 7 days 24 hours put it right back on but when I say I cut I mean I'm cutting water weight I'm manipulating the water I'm not trying to lose muscle mass and things like that because then I could actually get weaker. I don't want to be weaker for that. I want to be stronger for the fight. Sure. Yeah. I think that makes more sense when I think about it. I couldn't gain 20 pounds in eight hours even if I ate like a lot. I mean, with the process. Right? That's, I mean, a, lot of, like, that's a lot like, of pizzas. I do that's a like lot of pizza. pizza a lot. Oh, no, but, but don't get me wrong. <laughs> after a fight, I could gain that much weight yeah. <laughs> by eating. But with fighters, we try to manipulate the water more so than muscle mass. Well, you know? why, though? I mean, why not just be like, hey, this is what we weigh, let's just fight. Like, why go through that whole other, like, process? Why of not prepar- just fight at 185? Because, I mean, with fighting, there's a whole, the weight system. 
Now, you look at if I'm walking around 198 and I decide, hey, you know what? I want to fight at 198. I'm probably fighting a guy that's coming down from probably 215, 220, 225. You know what I mean? So I'm naturally going to be the smaller person in the ring. So for fighters, this is a kind of like a I won't, it's not cheating in a sense, but giving yourself a little upper hand. And you everyone I mean? does it. There's kind of like yeah. an agreed thing. That's that's the big that's the big kicker with it is you do it because everyone's doing it. If 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 everyone had this like unilateral agreement to not do it and everyone just fought at their walking way to be great, but then if there's one person that's cutting down in the ring, it's a huge difference when you walk into the ring with somebody who weighs 15, 20 pounds more than you. So because somebody else is cutting that way, you competitively, to stay at a competitive weight with them, need to do it as well. So can you talk a little bit, Josh, about coming back up? So you've cut the weight, you've weighed in, your fight's you know, in 24 hours. What do you do? I mean, do you just go for a burger or... Oh, good Lord, no, good Lord. No. I, mean, well, remember, I wish. Remember that Elijah said that the, 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 the vast majority of this weight that's being lost is in water, right? And the vast majority of that water is being lost in the last about 36 hours before your actual weigh-in. So what we need to regain then is we need to regain that water, regain those electrolytes, regain those nutrients. Um, so everyone kind of has their own special concoction. But ideally, even up to the weigh-in, you're still eating food. If you stop eating food to lose weight, you're, you're causing a ton of harm because your body's losing nutrients to supply fuel to those muscles. So you're ideally, you're still eating food. You're just cutting the water out. So when you want to regain that water, then uh, I like to do – right after my weigh-in, I like to do a, uh, a liter of Pedialyte. And then uh, mm. two liters. Mm, yeah. it's one of the, Getting you, sexy yeah. in here. <laughs> Pedialyte is one of those wonderful flavors that is absolutely disgusting unless you're dehydrated. So yes. you know you're dehydrated yeah. when Pedialyte tastes good. That's I mean, the poll quote for the show. Award-winning bartender prefers Pedialyte. No, they had one incident for one of my fights. I bought two bottles of Pedialyte, and I drank one right after weigh-in. And then the other one just sat in my fridge. And the week after the fight, I'm like, oh, I have this in my fridge. Might as well drink it. Taste it is the worst tasting thing you ever <laughs> I mean, it tastes horrible. But directly after I jumped off the, off the scale, drinking Pedialyte tastes awesome. It's the best thing in the world. For, for those that don't know, Pedialyte is a, a liquid uh, that is used to give infants that have been having bowel issues and may be severely dehydrated. So it is specially formulated to provide rehydration to uh, infants that are dehydrated. It's, it's basically medical Gatorade for babies and little kids. Basically, you yeah. You find it in the drugstore in the uh, medical first aid aisle under <laughs> okay. children's medicine. Okay. Uh, um, well, maybe switching gears. A little bit. Adam, you know, I want to talk also about, um, you know, eating to train. I think one of the things uh, I walked by a dig in, uh, I think over on 23rd the other day, and the in- it was like out of a movie scene. The entire, like, front table was filled with these really good-looking athletes who had just obviously, like, gotten out of their workout class and were, like, they're kind of, like, chowing down. And, and I think, you know, my, my understanding is dig in kind of has a rep as being, like, a good place to go post-workout to have like a healthy refuel and I'm wondering has your as you've kind of trained and are looking at kind of keeping your energy up for training does that influence like your menu or do you go after that athletic like audience or how do those two play together for you yeah I think it's more just the default setting yeah we're in the business of selling a lot of vegetables um it's like 70 75 percent of what we sell um so you know, if you're coming in to get a plate with uh naturally raised flank steak brussels sprouts and, and sauteed broccoli um it's sort of hard to go wrong there right um and if you're talking about grains it's farro or it's quinoa or it's brown rice um and so just by virtue of how we think about food and, and the right stuff to put in your bodies, it's not so much tailored per se to the mm-hmm. fitness crowd, um, but it's widely appropriate. And, and for me personally, in the context of training, uh, it just makes it easier because I'm always in the restaurants and um, I just have a lot of access and I don't have to pay for it, right? So, um, <laughs> you know, if I can be eating sautéed kale and, and Brussels sprouts and sweet potatoes all day long, I think typically, you know, that's the stuff that you'd otherwise want to be consuming while you're in fight, fight training anyways. Um, but it's, you know, having never stepped in the ring, nor have I cut weight. Um, when I was in school, beginning freshman year, I was paired with um, a guy on the wrestling team who became my best friend. We lived together for four years. And so some of my closest friends uh, during my four years at school were wrestlers, and they had to cut weight just like these guys 
do. Um, and so it's having never done it, it's a little bit of sort of a heady thing conceptually. Right? Sure. So walking around, I weigh about the same as Elijah. And I don't, I can't remember, you know, at what point in my life I was 175 pounds. You, right. You know, it feels like I was 12 years old. Right. So haven't done it. Uh, 12 year old. <laughs> 15. <laughs> Watch out. Husky. Watch out. Yeah. yeah. He was the hurricane. Yeah. Exactly. 165 uh, pounds, a 12 year old. <laughs> but it sounds intimidating. Right. I mean, that to me, having not done it before, that sounds really intimidating. Drop 20. And I'm, it's, it's not like I'm carrying around a bunch of extra weight. So where does that come from? And I, and I understand it does come from water. But the water. It, it's yeah. It's intimidating. Yeah. I think one of the good points Aaron brought up too is that when she asked Josh hey after you weigh in do you eat like a burger you know what I mean and a lot of times people think you know what I've cut the weight I've weighed in time to eat whatever I want you're hitting the buffet and you're yeah, going crazy like, with ice cream and pizza and- that's not how it is because tomorrow you still have to you still have to compete you know what I mean and people fail to realize that eating that burger that greasy food it, it doesn't affect you a week from now it affects you immediately you know what I mean? You got to look at for six weeks, you've been in super clean. You know what I mean? And all of a sudden, you haven't even fought yet. You just made weight and you go have a greasy burger or you go have something like that. It affects your body right away. You know what I mean? For me, I stay clean up until the fight. Elijah, what do you mean when you say super clean? Because that is a word that's an adjective that you hear all the time in athletic and sports. That's and the such fight a world. trigger word for me. <laughs> and like, it makes Aaron <laughs> crazy to hear that word clean. But people say, oh, well, you know, I'm cleaning up my diet. I'm trying to eat clean. Mm-hmm. What, what do you mean when you say that? I mean, for me, it's controlling your sugars. You know what I mean? And I try to, whenever I'm getting ready for a fight, I like to cook at home. So when you say controlling your sugars, you mean the obvious like sweets like M and M's and yeah. candy. But when you say sugars, are you also talking about sugars in fruit and no, 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 not that so much. Kind of stuff? But I mean, you do want to control that too. You still don't want to consume a ton of sugar from fruit. But for me, like I said, I cook at, whenever I'm getting ready for a fight. I cook at home, so I have complete control of what's in my food. You know what I mean? I'm not going out and be like, well, you know what? I'm getting this platter. Yeah, it's this, but I have no idea what it's seasoned what's with, what's in actually it. in yeah. it. You know what I mean? When I cook at home, I know exactly what's in my food. And I believe that if you want to take, be taken seriously as a fighter or an athlete, you have to take control of what you eat. That's where it starts. So that's why it pisses me off when I hear people like, well, I didn't know my protein shake had this and this and this and this. I'm like, dude. Read the you're, label. You're a professional athlete. How do you not know what you consume it? You know what I mean? I think it's completely ridiculous. So for me to have complete control, I eat everything at home. So what about, you know, there's a big article in the Times a couple weeks ago, uh, Coca-Cola funding, all these studies that, like, the issue that we have in America is not that we are eating too much or eating the wrong things. It's that we're not exercising enough. So... No. I think. Come on. <laughs> do we even have to? I mean. We, I mean, actually, apparently we do because, like, this is like, I mean, this is. According to the New York a, Times. Right. Well, no, the I mean, New York Times, in, in their defense, I mean, this was an expose of a, a lot of Coke funded studies, scientific peer reviewed papers that are coming out saying that, like, actually, if we just move more, we can eat whatever we want. Um, I don't think that's right. And it's sending the wrong message to people. You know what I mean? Oh, sit on your couch, eat Cheetos, and eat whatever you want, and go work out. No. Those things affect you immediately. It's not, oh, I had a good workout, I could have this. It's like, no. Like, I've had people I know who fight and say, oh, today's my cheat day. I'm like, what do you mean cheat day? There's no such thing as a cheat day. If you're eating correctly and you're eating proper foods, there shouldn't be no reason for a cheat day. Not once during my fight training, I'm like, oh, it's the weekend. Um, it's my cheat day. Like, no. my Everything I eat is flavorful. You know what I mean? And I, I eat in a healthy way, but I make it fun. So I don't have to have a cheat day. There's no such thing as a cheat day. I, I would actually, I would come in on a little bit of a disagreement with Elijah on this one, I, I have fight, to say. Fight, fight, <laughs> fight, <laughs> um, Because for, for some people, when you look at a dramatic shift in your diet... 
for somebody to go from having something that they're used to indulging in, they're used to willing to give into a certain craving to the crave for fat, the crave for sugar. Your body develops a mental and a, a cycle and a physical addiction to the feeling of these things. So for somebody that has this issue, for them to go and to say 100%, I cannot have this anymore, or to cut it down to such a level where your body's still craving it and it is not feeding that craving, it becomes, I think, sometimes harder for the person to stick to this new format. Um, I, I'm not saying that you should, you know, allot yourself to go out and, and pig out and be, go crazy with it. But um, I know for myself, when I tell myself, no matter what it is in life, it could be a physical act, physical activity, and I say you can no longer do this ever. That becomes mentally the thing I want to do more so than much, anything in yeah. the world. And it's not even that I want it that much. It's just that I, knowing that I can't have it makes me want it. So the idea of a cheat day for me is not saying that it's a day for me to just go do whatever and pig out and have all this stuff. It's a way of mentally saying... I don't need this today. I don't need this tomorrow. I don't need it the day after because five days from now, I get to indulge in it in a reasonable amount, reasonable being a really important word, but I do get to indulge in it in a little bit, which helps me mentally be stronger and helps me begin to develop the pattern of correct eating. Then once I begin developing a pattern, my body becomes used to good food. It becomes used to things that have healthy properties to it. My cravings for the negative things will begin to decrease. And I can then begin to cut it out in an easier manner. So I, I don't see a cheat day as a way to just go and do whatever you want to. But I do see it as a way of giving yourself a mental valve, a mental release that says, I can stick to this program because I know that there is a point in the future in which I do get to have a little bit of it. I think this is also predicated on the idea that, you know, when Joshua and Elijah and Adam are talking about the food they eat on a day-to-day -day basis and other people are talking about diet and cheat day, none of them are talking about going to town at, like, McDonald's or eating food that's, like, <laughs> oh, packed with, like, know. chemicals in, like, a Hot Pocket or McDonald's. When they talk about cheat day they're talking about going into talking about pasta exactly they're talking about ice cream and <laughs> cookies and you know totally pasta and those kinds of things but there's there's a line of demarcation in terms of your health and your body that you have to go from you know processed chemically loaded food which is never good which represents a lot of the cheat day because people yeah. think oh now i'm gonna eat doritos now i'm gonna have a pop tart mm -hmm. whereas you need to sort of cross the line into that clean eating Elijah's talking about and then the cheat day becomes something about like sugar fat and carbs but one of the things I mean like Josh said it's hard to tell someone hey you know what you cannot have this okay so with me a lot of times what I do with my clients is that I don't like to say diet because immediately you tell someone to diet and they're like oh my god I can't have this I can't have that I can't it's like no find healthy substitutes you know what I mean don't say hey you know what I can't have this chocolate. Okay, have an apple. They're not remotely close together. <laughs> no. I know, I know, but you I still mean, like get that sugar craving. But can it be even like close? Can it be like a little piece of chocolate? So it's or funny. Like a better piece of it's chocolate, funny, or like a quality piece of chocolate. It's funny. A couple years ago, one of my clients came to me. He's like, "Man, I'm addicted to chocolate. I can't stop having it." I'm like, "All right, cool, no problem. You train five days a week, okay? Saturday, Sunday, Saturday." You could have some chocolate, but don't have the same portion you normally do. The whole bag. Don't have the whole bag or have the whole bar. Have half. Sunday, none. Get ready to work on Monday. And the funny thing is by doing that those couple of days without it, when you do get to have it, you realize, I don't need it. Because you limit, you limit yourself from it. So eventually you realize... That one day I get to have it, it's like, uh, I really don't need it. All right, well, I'm going to call you out and see if, <laughs> if, you, if you practice what you preach. Because for those of you all listening along, Elijah has a huge sweet tooth. Yeah. And one of the things that he gives up when he's in fight camp is sweets and chocolates and candies. So yeah. how do you tame your chocolate habit? I mean, I think it's completely different for fighters and professional athletes. Like I said, we go to a fight camp six to eight weeks, and we know there's a rhyme or reason for everything we do. You know what I mean? So I know me giving up having any sweets 
is for a reason. It's for me to get in the ring and be at the best, be able to perform at peak performance. So for that time, I know, you know what, no matter what. That's your drive. That's, that's my drive. That's your drive. I have an end game, and this is my end game, is getting in the ring and fighting. And knowing that I have to perform. You know what I mean? What scares me the most about fighting is always my cardio. I could go out and run 10 miles and do all those things, but then the closer I get to the fight, the more I get nervous about my cardio. Which, if people should go to the internet and just Google Elijah Clark Muay Thai fights and click on video. And there's videos of him fighting primarily on the Friday Night Fights YouTube page. When you watch him fight, you do not think that cardio is a problem for him. Mm -hmm. But that's the thing. It's like, (laughs) for me, I know eating those sweets are going to handle my cardio. Eating those bad things are going to handle my cardio. So I know for that six to eight, eight to six weeks, I have to... You know what? It's cut off completely. But for the ordinary person, you can't tell them like, "Hey, you know what? Cut this off immediately." I mean, it's hard for anyone to do that. So yeah, we, we are in the, the room with superheroes, <laughs> not ordinary ordinary people. <laughs> but as Elijah pointed out, most of the population they're not in fight camp and they're mm-hmm. not fighters. And so I think a, a big part of it is, is, as we've discussed here, is just avoiding extremes. You know, it doesn't have to be so extreme to one end. Um, and when we think about food. Um, it's really a lot more about what's sustainable. You know, so your point about just avoiding all the processed, industrial, sort of trans fat um, sort of crap that's out there and eating real and whole foods. You know, there's been a lot that's been written recently about fats and the role they play in weight loss and weight gain and saturated fats and, you know, the fat that comes from meat and real butter versus things like margarine, things that are a lot more processed. And, and I think we all know how that story's playing out, right? It's the real stuff. So to the extent that you want to put you know, really high quality, you know, from the farm butter on a really beautiful piece of bread that was just baked fresh in the back of the kitchen. There's no issue with that. You should not shy away from those things, but it's about balance. Don't have an entire loaf of bread, you know, lathered in butter seven days a week. Well, make sure it is uh, bread made with ancient grains that has undergone a long fermentation process. <laughs> and then I'm like, yo, that sounds clean to me. <laughs> um, wow. Thank you so much, guys, for being part of our debut episode. Thank you very much. That was great. Thank you, guys. Thank you for having us. All right. Right on. (laughs) Um, If you're out there, stay tuned. We'll bring you more uh, future episodes of the B-Side. We'd love to hear what sides you want to get into. You know, food people who are uh, musicians, bikers, um, or more fighters, get in touch. You can find us at info at heritageradionetwork.org. We are a member-supported nonprofit, so if you like what you hear, please visit the website, click that Donate tab, and become a member today. Thanks so much for listening. Stay tuned in. Thanks for listening to this program on heritageradionetwork.org. You can find all of our archived programs on our website or as podcasts in the iTunes store by searching Heritage Radio Network. You can like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter at Heritage underscore radio. You can email us with questions anytime at info at heritageradionetwork.org. Heritage Radio Network is a 501c3 nonprofit. To donate and become a member, visit our website today. Thanks for listening. 